before I start this morning, I just want to extend my appreciation to Charmaine, who um, is pinch hitting and filling in last moment for Brendan. Brendan called me on Wednesday afternoon saying that he was tested positive with COVID. So keep him in your prayers as he recovers and heals. So thank you for filling in at the last moment. It's always a pleasure having you with us. Will you come to prayer with me this morning? Loving God, we are grateful that you are the hands in our lives and that even when we stumble down that road, that even going down the wrong path, we know that you're always there. Prepare us with our hearts and our minds this day and our spirits as we are renewed and transformed by the words and the renewing of our minds that we may become more Christ-like in all of our ways. So now, God, I ask that you would touch my lips to play, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day and the words that come from my mouth and along with the meditations on each and all of our hearts. May they ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. So this morning we are bringing to a close our sermon series that we've titled Road Trip 2022. And throughout this series, we've been trying to compare the idea of life to a road trip. And we've come to different intersections along with some other kinds of road signs that have come into our lives and how we make some changes if necessary. And this morning, as we conclude our series, we're going to talk about the road to blessing. Now, the word blessed can be used in many different contexts. And we use the word blessed or blessing in lots of different ways. You know that sometimes when people pray, they'll say, well, somebody say the blessing. Or we use the word blessed a lot when people sneeze. I know that's kind of gross, but bless you. And of course, there is one of my favorites, the bless your heart. <laughs> Especially those in the South will use that phrase, oh, bless your heart. And we all know the Southern code for, well, you're not so smart, are you? <laughs> we also see the hashtag blessed all over the place. Especially on Facebook, you know, I've got a new boyfriend or girlfriend, hashtag blessed. Well, if I've got a new boyfriend, I'm not sure I would use the hashtag blessed, more like hashtag, damn, it's about time. <laughs> but getting serious for a moment, what does it all mean from a biblical standpoint to be blessed? Well, from a biblical standpoint, to be blessed is pretty much to have God's divine favor working in your life. So after hearing all that, how many of us want to be blessed? I would hope that everybody sitting here this morning or watching online would want to be blessed. I mean, who wouldn't want to get God's divine favor and blessing working in their life? Even if you don't believe in God, you have to admit, if there is a God, it would be nice to have God's divine favor working as part of your life. But yet, when it comes to our faith, we're already blessed. And by placing our faith in Jesus, each of us have been blessed with forgiveness, we're blessed with the hope of eternal life, we're blessed with God's spirit that has come to dwell within us, and we've been blessed by family and friends, and of course, our church community. We are blessed in so many different ways already. So since we are blessed in so many ways, are there things that we can do to position ourselves to be even more blessed? Are the things that we can do to put ourselves, put ourselves in a position where God will bless us even more? Well, I think there is. And during this series, we've made multiple stops on the road, first by the man by the pool, then with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and then our friend Nicodemus. And this morning, I'm somewhat going to go back to one of our stops and visit with Nicodemus again. But as we heard in the previous road trip sermons, that Nicodemus was and went to Jesus at night. And we know that Nicodemus was a religious leader. He was a Pharisee, which was the class of religious leaders at that time. And we know that he was a very successful kind of guy. You know, he had clout, he had popularity, he had it all. And if you imagine a senator who is also a Harvard professor, who is also a pastor, and you kind of are standing put with a picture reminding us that's who Nicodemus was. 
In fact, when Jesus talks to Nicodemus, in fact, excuse me, when Nicodemus and Jesus talk, that Jesus is interacting with one of the most accomplished persons that he's interacted with to date at that point in his life. And we know that our buddy Nick is high off the ladder. He's in part of the ancient world, but still he comes to see Jesus. And if you remember from my sermon several weeks ago, we know that he comes at night knowing that if he could, if that could damage his reputation, that he, he would do that because he came at night because he didn't want to damage it. So he, he came sort of sneaking around, but came to see Jesus. And we all know that around this time that Jesus also had enemies and all the conversations that were rumbling around town, but Nicodemus came at a private time. And I think one of the things we learned, especially as we look through the entire story of Nicodemus' life, is because he had an open heart. Here is a guy who has given his whole life to understanding the true depths of the Bible, who dedicated his whole life and education and learning, who had accomplished all of these credentials, and who had all of this influence and clout. But he was still hungry for God in life and was willing to come up to somebody who had no credentials from any, any credential or cultural standpoint, no degrees, no cultural standpoint, no clout. But he still sought in Jesus because he sensed that God was working in this person's life. So one of the first qualities on the road to being blessed and more blessed is simply this. Stay hungry. Nicodemus stayed hungry. I think as Christians that we need to stay hungry because I think that there is the case in our spiritual lives. I mean, we all go through different seasons in our lives, but often we're hungry for God. And when we're going through those difficult things in our lives, that's usually the first sense. Maybe our relationships are falling apart. Maybe there is a weird family dynamic going on. Or maybe you're facing health challenges. Or maybe you're in desperation that we cry out for God and reach out for God. And that's awesome because that's the one thing we should be doing is reaching out. However, I want to suggest that even if you are in a comfortable season, it's still a perfect time to be hungry and to want to reach out. The habits we maintain in our off season is a whole different standpoint. We have a huge impact of how we play in that particular season in our lives and how we prepare to be in that off season. The tendency for each of us to do that is when God has blessed us in so many ways. And if we're not careful, we can take our eyes off God. And the God that we focused on to get to the place of blessing becomes the very God we take our eyes off of because we get distracted by other things that are going on all around us. Sort of what the Israelites did over and over again. God would bless them, provide for them. They would get comfortable and then they would just drift off and then end up turning their hearts from God. So even if you're feeling comfortable right now, you've still got to stay hungry. Because if you stay hungry and keep seeking God and stay hungry spiritually, it will prepare you for the inevitable difficult seasons that you will face. A very profound piece of scripture that we heard this morning in our gospel lesson in Matthew's gospel, where we heard in the gospel is almost like Jesus is giving us permission to nag. God, which means this could be literally be translated into to keep asking or to keep seeking or to keep knocking and to do all of this, and God will respond if we do so. It somewhat reminds me of the story where Jesus is saying, look and ask. Ask and keep asking and seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. I can't say that I know what any of you are praying for in your life at any given moment. I don't know where you hope God will bless you in your life. However, I want to encourage you to stay hungry around those areas. Maybe for some of you, you're praying that you'll know more of God. That God will soften your heart and fill you with the love and joy and peace with abundance. 
And you may have prayed for that, but nothing really happened. But don't stop. Because we hear Jesus telling us to keep asking and to keep seeking and to keep praying because God will respond. I think one of the greatest ways that God will respond is as God begins to change our hearts as we begin to seek God. We have to remember that Jesus didn't come to just being partially blessed in our lives, but came to bless us with eternally new kinds of life. So stay hungry spiritually. I think we're always being tested on this. Right now, each of us is being tested and we're being tested often where God is preparing to bless you. So don't give up, don't check out, don't quit, but stay hungry. Here's another principle or quality if you want to position yourself for more blessings in your heart in life. And it's not the only way to stay hungry, but it's to also stay humble, and it's to have a humble heart before God. I have to say, there have been a few times in my life where I have been very humbled. It takes a lot for me to be greatly humbled sometimes. One that I can think of actually goes back to when I was being ordained. When we were determining who was going to officiate my ordination, because my first choice wasn't able or going to be able to do so, that be known to me that back in the <clears throat> early stages of my ministry, Reverend Troy had determined long before I even knew where I was going that he was going to be the one to do the act. And I was going to have him present in a part of my <clears throat> part of my ordination as a professional courtesy. <coughs> excuse me, and that. Of course, the church in Los Angeles being my home church at the time was also his home church. But we actually took him to lunch one day and we were able to have that discussion and he stopped us mid-conversation and said to us in the traditional Troy Perry fashion, oh honey, now only am I flattered, but I had told myself when you entered into ministry that I was going to be the one to ordain you and to do it for many reasons. And when he shared those reasons, I somewhat was speechless, but more than that, I was truly humbled. I was humbled because from inside his heart, to take the pride that he was able to ordain me being the first openly Orthodox Armenian minister, not only in MCC, but in any denomination, was a privilege. But he also took a vested interest in my journey from the very start that it was an interest that he does quite often. I have to say that when I was taken up to him for the very first time, basically with two people with my arms, basically putting me right in front of him and having him told that he needs to bring me back into MCC and to get me to be ordained clergy, it was another humbling, humbling moment in my life. But we all have humbling moments, and Nicodemus is about to have a humbling moment himself. So if you remember, he comes to Jesus and actually tries to butter him up a little bit, flatter him, you know, and he calls him master or rabbi or teacher, you know, the very respectful words that somebody who doesn't have any credentials. I actually prefer sir or daddy, but that's a whole different, <laughs> whole different matter. But he actually says that he wants to know God and knows that God was sent him to be taught, which was being implied that he was sent to teach the religious leaders. I will say that commentators note that throughout this conversation with Jesus, Nicodemus is pretty much at this posture and pretty much displays that I'm going to give you some legitimacy here, Jesus. It's that if you help me, I'll help you. And Jesus pretty much immediately just shuts it down. And we heard back a week or so ago from John's gospel where Jesus was saying, I'll tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You have to take a step back and hear what Jesus is saying. You know, Nick didn't really hear that. And says that I don't need anything, but what is actually needed is to come, that will come from God. And I'm sure you can imagine that this was probably a shocking statement to Nicodemus, probably a shocking statement to a lot. And Nicodemus would have been this Jewish religious leader. And as we mentioned, 
at his core. Nicodemus felt like he would inherit that kingdom of God because of his first natural birth, because he was Jewish. But Jesus says, if we remember from a week or so ago, oh no, you must be born again. But at the same time, Nicodemus would have never have thought any of this and probably would have offered the idea of being more of a morally educated religious expert who gives the entire life and all that training that would be need to be born again spiritually. You could probably look at it as Jesus saying that everything you worked for your entire life wasn't enough. But the picture that Jesus painted was both a spiritual birth. And when we think of it, the implication can be significant because the implications are what a baby brings to a birthing process is basically helplessness. And what we bring to the spiritual birth process is helplessness. We come with our sin, we come with our shame, we come with our brokenness, we come with all of our failures, we come with our faith and hope, but we have nothing to offer God. I mean, we don't come and stand on our background, our degrees or our accomplishments. We have to be born again to experience spiritual birth. And it comes when you come to God in faith and you place your trust in Christ. It's about what God does in your heart. And we bring helplessness to God each and every moment. And the best part about all this is that at the foot of the cross, we're all equal. We all come packaged as the same way as sinners. We come packaged in the need that we are people that need to be saved in the need of God's hope. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter how much we make. It doesn't mean how knowledgeable we are. But the important thing is that we all are one. It is the foot of the cross where we are equal and we know that God's love is there. And God sent that only begotten to die for each of us where we bring our helplessness. God brings that help each and every time. It's sort of like, you bring the sin and God will bring the salvation. You bring the shame, God will bring the spirit. You bring the gunk and God brings all the glory. You show up just like a newborn shows up with very little to offer and God gets into gear and does all the work. So we have to stay hungry we have to stay humble in our lives, and of course, we need to stay faithful. We have to stay faithful, and there's a few verses in Galatians that says, those who belong to Christ have crucified their ego with its passions and desires. So since we live by the Spirit, let us follow her lead. We must stop being conceited, contentious, and envious. We've got to follow the Spirit's lead. We've got to stay humble. We've got to be faithful in our positions of ourselves so we get more blessings. We grow spiritually by following Jesus through our faith to God and Jesus and our trust in God, but we grow in our spiritual life by positioning ourselves to do certain things. As we heard back weeks ago, we heard Jesus say that we have to be born of water and the Spirit. And we know the water is the reference to baptism, and that we know that being baptized is that we're being raised up. <clears throat> we also were baptized and being raised up, but we also are dying off our old selves, and as we are rising into that new walk of life is when we are then born by the Spirit. And when we grow into that, God has all that for us as people are being positioned and we are being blessed in so many great ways. <coughs> God just doesn't want to partially bless our lives. But instead, God wants us to be in that eternally new kind of life. So in other words, stay hungry, stay humble, stay faithful in your life. Nicodemus would have left this encounter with Jesus more than likely with a lot of questions. And this is where Jesus makes his famous statement that we've heard time and time again that God so loved the world, that God sent the one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, that whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. 
And in the midst of that conversation, we don't really know how Nicodemus felt when it was all over. It only shows up again two or three more times throughout the gospel. One other time we hear of Nicodemus is when he stands up and defends Jesus in front of a group of religious leaders. And the next time we see or hear Nicodemus is at the end of John's gospel where Jesus has been crucified and nailed to the cross. And you hear this one little line. It says, a man named Joseph of Arimathea and a man named Nicodemus came to the cross, took Jesus' body, took it down off the cross, prepared his body for burial, and placed him in a tomb. It's a great model to stay humble, to stay hungry, to stay, to stay faithful in order to position ourselves for God and bless each and every one of us. Blessings upon each of you this day. Amen.